In this episode of Revival on the Air today, I interview Pastor Chris from our Hungary Fellowship and his wife Monica. They both have a great story to tell, which started when Chris moved to Hungary from Australia and met Monica, who came from a communist background. Today, many years later, they've been involved in building a great fellowship in Hungary and have a great bond through the Holy Spirit. Monica tells also of how she was healed from a brain tumour. Sorry about the audio quality of this episode. When I recorded this back at Easter in 2018, I made the mistake in recording, which has taken a fair bit of work to rescue. That said, it's a fantastic testimony, which is well worth the listen. Monica, Pastor Chris. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, taking the time to share your testimony with us. Um, we're at uh, Karakalinga Camp, which is just south of Adelaide. You're not normally from Adelaide, you're from Sydney. Hungary. Well, originally Sydney. You're originally from Sydney. Yeah, two years in the law in Sydney and then many more years in the Lord over in Hungary. So how long have you been hungry? 25 years going on to 26. Wow. Yeah, I think it was uh, the 5th of February 1991 when I left Australia, so it makes it nearly 26 years. And you don't have a slight Hungarian accent at all. Mm. But Monica, <laughs> on the other hand, <laughs> so you grew up in Hungary, didn't you, Monica? I did, yeah. So I was really interested to hear both of your testimonies uh, because obviously they're intertwined now that you're married. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, Chris, really your journey with God, I think you mentioned, just started here in Australia uh, back in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Um, How did that come about? Well, I had a sister who – I've got two sisters and a brother and they're all older than me by a long way, like um, 10 years older, 9 years older, 8 years older. So they were all teenagers around the same time. And um, obviously, they were not. Um, most of them were rebellious in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, it caused a lot of trouble in the family. My brother he loved motorbikes, and um, you know the speed they can do, and seemed to always get into trouble one way or the other. And um, my older sister um, turns out in the end she was going out with a boy who was a bit of a drug dealer, and sort of um, you know that that's, that was a bit disruptive, of course. And then uh, my my sister closer to me, she came to the Lord when I was about seven or eight, and um, she just completely. I mean, not that I'd known exactly what had happened, but I just seen that she, you know, completely changed. She's she's become a nice person. <laughs> and so you saw that change without understanding the why yeah. behind it. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know exactly what happened, but she just seemed to be nice um, now. Uh, but mum and dad wanted to do a bit of investigation because they were really uh, concerned about how she changed so much and what is this revival centres as it was at the time. So they went to check it out and they took me along. I remember being at one of the meetings and hearing speaking in tongues for the first time. I thought it was must have been a joke. Uh, it just sounded so weird. Somebody speaking in tongues, you know, the spiritual gifts came up and the person right in front of me was the first one that came out in spiritual gifts and I'd I opened up my eyes to, to let laughter come out, and I looked around and said, everyone's serious. Oh, this is a serious thing. And then, <laughs> then um, you know, I don't know, it must have been the Lord. He just he withheld the laughter because it was on its way. Yeah. Um, but it just didn't come out. And uh, I thought, that's something which is really weird. But um, two years went by. I didn't really understand much more. Mum and Dad stopped coming because, you know, they thought they found the fellowship was okay. I didn't come anymore. My sister kept uh, witnessing to me. She did say one or two things which stuck. Um, one... Strangely enough, there's a scripture from Revelations. Uh, I don't know why she showed it to me. I don't know what we're talking about, but she said, um, you read a scripture that Lord would want you to be either hot or cold. Mm-hmm. And I could identify with that because um, I knew what she was, was probably what you consider to be in that scripture reference to be hot. Uh, she was just going all the time to the um, meetings and, and um, um, reading a Bible. and You could just see that she was full on. And uh, I knew that I was not probably the category of cold. You know, I believed in God, sort of. I was a Catholic, though I never liked going to church at all. Uh, anyway, it was compulsory and just in and out as fast as possible. So I knew I wasn't cold, so I sort of looked myself as being lukewarm. And I thought, oh, that's not going to be very nice to have Jesus spew out of his mouth, but sort of like that's the way the scripture goes. Mm. Um, but I, you know, could brush that aside five minutes afterwards and just go on with life. But I got to the age of 16 and um, was the summertime and Jackie, my sister, was going to a camp and I wanted to visit them and I, the only way I could really visit them was to go to the camp as well, so I thought I'd just go. Uh, so that was at Maria yeah, and um, in 88. Um, got to the camp and just really, yeah, had my eyes opened and I really loved it actually. I sort of, all the people seemed normal. For me, Christians, um, you know, were a bit weird. 
but I just found them to be, you know, a bit dis- detached from life, I suppose. They're sort of like a bit on their own planet a little bit, but these are all normal people, you know, and uh, they were surfing and doing stuff that you'd normally do, but they just had this really serious belief in God. And, um, of course, it was all drawn back to the Holy Spirit, receiving this Holy Spirit. So I thought, oh, well, it would be a bad thing to get. Um, but I saw, I saw it was real. The people, These people actually have it. I got baptized at that camp and uh, received the Holy Spirit straight afterwards, just the way uh, it was described in the Bible. Um, I expected that I would receive it, and I did, and then I knew for myself, okay, it's all real. Wow. That's how it all started. So how did you come to be in Hungary? My dad, he's Hungarian. Mm-hmm. So um, he was born there in a little country village uh, on a farm, actually. And uh, he, when he was 16, he went up to the big city, Budapest. He was 18 when the revolution broke out in Hungary. So um, he was part of um, the revolution. So he took arms and um, they fought against the Russian army for a few days there but um, that was you know, quickly dealt with in 1956 and then he had to flee because um, he, if they would have caught him they probably would have killed him because he was part of the, the rebels I suppose. So he went came to Australia and when we were children we used to travel to Hungary all the time to visit his relatives so my uncle my auntie stayed mm-hmm. there and seven I was I think in 1979 we went the first time so I really, that was still communism so I spent, there was a time when I was sick, when I was 15, I spent three months there to learn Hungarian. Um, so when I was two years in the Lord, so two years after I got baptized in Spirit Field, I so just you finished. Were 18 at that point? Yeah, yep. just finished my high school. And um, everyone from school was going to either, um, you know, university or work. And I thought, oh, I'd like to do something different, not the same as everybody else type thing. Oh, I'd like to go to Hungary for a year. Uh, it was the plan just to go for a year and come back. <laughs> 25 years later, you're still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think thank God had since then. Thank God had different plans for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I also, you know, I spoke to people in the fellowship about it. I spoke to the pastors in Sydney about it at the time and said, look, this is my plans. And they said, yeah, sure, go. <laughs> so and so, how did you two meet? Yeah, well, we, well, I came to, I landed in Hungary in 91 and uh, we met in 92. And um, it was basically a business seminar. So um, it was a business seminar. We were on stage. Uh, there was a group of about 2,000 people, I suppose, and we were talking on stage with my mum. And then uh, Monica was in the back somewhere, and she heard Australia. And he said, we're from Australia. So that interested her. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she found my mum after the um, conference was finished. They were just chatting, and then I saw mum and Monica chatting. And then uh, when I introduced myself, and, um, yeah, mum actually hired her to be a translator because mum would speak Hungarian and then we were travelling together, three of us sort of like in the countryside and stuff and that's when Monica heard the gospel. So what did you think of the gospel when you heard it? Because obviously Hungary was a very different country back when you were growing up than it is today. Yeah, well, it used to be a communist country when I was growing up so I was taught to fit into the box I was taught to be a brick in the wall Mm. and not ask too many questions, just fit in. And I did, but I didn't like it. As as I was growing up, my grandfather had held a position in the Communist Party, so our family was actually monitored by the Communist Party. Because of his role. Because of his role. uh, We had special passports, so we had to report where we travelled, if we travelled, I actually had a chauffeur that drive me to kindergarten every morning with a big Vol- Volga. I don't know if you know the Russian cars. Yeah. So it was just a, a different, a altogether different setup. I did what I had to. I did what I was taught, but I could always feel that I don't want to fit into the box. And when Christopher came, it wasn't actually his words that convinced me at first. At that time, he was dealing with a very difficult family issue. Jacqueline, the sister who witnessed to Christopher, was going through a bone marrow transplant Mm -hmm. and Christopher was rounding up all the cousins for blood tests and bone marrow samples to see which one of them would be the best fit. The way he handled that situation, the way he handled the cousins and his feelings, that spoke to me first. He was very calm and I could see the torment that he was going through, but he just had this amazing, I don't know, something that helped him through that and gave him a wisdom that I never 
I never came across before. Wow. So I see, I saw his character first, um, and then he, of course, witnessed to me, and then I understood it must have been the Lord working, mm. the Holy Spirit working mm. in him. And um, by this time, I was I was already looking because communism by this time failed, and um, the Russians went home after a forty-five years of rule and reign in Hungary. They just decided from one day to the other to leave. No shed of blood. The whole system mm. just changed and everything got liberalized and you could choose what you want to do. Uh, I was looking for the answers. All of a sudden people didn't know. You know, there was a vacuum of power when the system change takes over like that and you were told and taught for 45 years to believe in something and all of a sudden that something is gone. Uh, people are are looking. It must have been what bewildering next? for people to have grown up in such a regimented society one day, and then that that vacuum the next would have been just amazing. For them. It was very hard for a lot of people, I imagine, to understand that. I had first hand experience with that because my grandfather had a nervous breakdown. He because he didn't do things because of the benefits. He did it because he believed in it. He mm. believed it was a good system. And when the Russians left, he, he, he didn't know what to do anymore. He didn't know what to believe anymore. Wow. And yeah, I witnessed that as a, as a teenager. Anyway, churches were opened and I started to, um, to seek and search uh, not only churches but ideologies as well. I wanted to check out what's on the table mm. so I could find my way. And Chris came in the exact right time. The Lord came in the exact right time yeah. for me. I was open and, uh, yeah, I heard the gospel from Chris and he showed me in the Bible what I had to do and that was so good because there was no ifs and buts. Um, it was a commandment. I had mm. to be baptized mm. and that was clear for me. It's not a choice. It's a commandment. So I wanted to, but in Hungary there was no fellowship, nowhere to go to to get baptized or, or so he invited me to go to an English camp with him in 92, Easter camp. We went and uh, I saw a group of about maybe 150 people there, old and young, black and white, and coming from Hungary where you n I, never, I never seen black people before. Um, I've never mixed in crowds with old and young and kids and, and seniors. And I could just tell that they, they were all facing one way, and I was the odd one out again, uh, not fitting into their box kind of thing. And they were the one thing that struck me was uh, that they were all very keen to help me to receive this Holy Spirit. I didn't kind of understand at first why they care, because coming from communism, there is no individualism in there. Mm. The person doesn't count. It's always the greater cause that matters, and, and these people were there all offering prayer for me and with me, young people. And and these are people you just met? These are people I, I've seen for the first time. And tell you what, they were funny. I always thought Christians would be dark and dull. <laughs> 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 so that was very appealing as well. Uh, yeah, so did I, you have any belief in God before? Was there any... Hope. I would call it a hope. Okay. Yeah, I hoped there was a creator, mm. but I wouldn't call it a belief. Mm. Yeah. So these people... Um, showed me in the scriptures and they came and prayed with me. We got there on the Thursday and kept praying every day and I received on the, on the, on the Saturday of that same week and I was baptized a few hours later. How did that make you feel? Free, free. I could, I could un identify myself for the very first time in my life. I was, they called me, these young people called me the child of God and that was fantastic. Mm. So then you got baptized a few hours later? Yeah. And I assume camp finished, and what happened after camp? Well, we knew there was a, there was a mutual attraction, so nine months later we were married. The, you know, we sort of knew we liked each other a lot, and, um, you know, Monica started to walk in the Lord, prays to Monica, and then wanted to speak to her parents about it, and they got all upset about it. Um, so we ended up coming out. I can Australia. imagine. I can imagine they would get upset. Yeah. I mean, here's this guy who's coming from the country, just taking their daughter away to England. She's got this newfound experience, talking about God now. She would just fly in the face of everything they probably would have known. It was too fast for them. I yeah, imagine. Just too fast. Yeah. yeah. But we knew the word of the Lord anyway, and we knew what God would sort of, you know, what God wants from us. And we thought, well, it doesn't matter what 
to what other people are thinking is so on to what's right. Yeah, that all worked out well in the end. Monica's mother and her sister, just after we got married and came back from Australia, they both came to the Lord. So um, uh, they were oh, completely wow. turned around because they were really upset. And then we came back and then things like that took place. So we found out making a stand for the Lord does have its fruits. Does have yeah, fruit. We've talked a bit about that today, haven't we, in, yeah. our, in our workshop. So, so was, there any, was it just your testimony of the change in you that your mother and your sister saw? Mum and my sister never let us witness to them. They were so closed off. Mum actually had a nervous breakdown when Chris asked for my hand in marriage. Um, so I can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a nice guy. Yeah, I can't yeah, imagine yeah, that. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> so um, they rejected every time we wanted to have a good witness to them. They rejected. So we had some family friends over for barbecue mm. one um, afternoon and they asked me, what, so what, what is this thing that happened to you? And, of course, when guests ask you, my mum's not going to say, don't talk about that type thing. So I got to witness to these friends who never did anything, but mum and my sister had to listen for the first time. While that converse, conversation was on, my sister, we have a huge garden uh, around that house. She went out for a walk in the garden and she put it to the test. She prayed on her own in the vineyards. And she came back and she said, it's all true. I'm speaking in tongues. What? Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> How old was she then? Uh, 14. Wow. Yeah. So it was powerful. Yeah. yeah. And then the same day, I think mum decided that she was going to get baptized with my sister because she, then she wanted to get baptized. Mum got baptized and mum received after the baptism. That's fantastic. And so now you've built a life, built a church, really, in Hungary. Well, we started with three people, and that was in um, 83, 90, 93, yeah. Um, Monica, she had before this, so before um, sister and mother came, she had a, a friend at university who also came, well, came to the Lord. She was basically the first one. The first one, when we started running regular meetings, we, we did – Try to have some meetings in 92, and we did have three people who got baptized and spirit filled. Um, you know, I witnessed to people and then some prayed with them to get spirit filled. And then I remember they wanted to get baptized. So I remember calling the pastors back in Sydney, Australia, and saying, Hey, there's some people over here who want to get baptized. What should I do? And they said, Baptize them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I never had any experience at all. Um, you know, in the fellowship, just being outside from being a person who just comes and loves coming to the meetings and, and being involved. So that was me. Um, so Isn't it's, it interesting? When we look back at you know, the apostles and the disciples in, in the early Christian church, a lot of them were no different. Fishermen, just guys come along, you know, next yeah. minute they're out there, you know, preaching the gospel, baptizing people, and, you know, through the power of God, performing wonderful miracles. But. Yeah, I suppose I was, I was hoping that, um, yeah, someone would come. Someone else. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. hoping someone would come. And, but in 92, when, when Monica's, uh, university friend came along, which was a bit interesting as well, because Monica was sort of like, uh, the life, the life of the party in university. It was sort of like her lifestyle, really into all that. And this friend of hers, um, was a small, she was a country girl, came from a small country town and, she was the exact opposite. So, you know, she'd be the one always, I don't know, on her own and not really having many friends. And Monica was having all friends and sort of like. So um, she noticed a change in Monica. And, and actually, I think the biggest change was that Monica actually started talking to her because they would never talk. Normally not in the same social circles. Yeah, okay. So um, she, I'm not very proud of this cat. That's why I tell it. That's, but that's your old self, right? That's, yeah. not, that's not your new, that's not the new self. Yeah, hard to imagine now, but. Yeah, the Lord's changed so much. Yeah. But she came. Uh, she also received at home alone. I never met her. We didn't pray with her. She just uh, was wanting to hear all this new information and wanted to thank the Lord that she has a friend at school um, sort of thing. And then she just burst out speaking. In fact, she called us on the telephone and said, you know, I was trying to pray and this language came out. So uh, we baptized her not long afterwards. And anyway, we just uh, then from then started running meetings. In the meantime... Monica had put an application in uh, to immigrate to Australia because the idea was we got married in Australia, we'll just go back to Hungary, get a visa sorted out, then we'll come out here. Um, but the visa took three months to be processed because they did it in Vienna. So we're just waiting for this visa to come through and then Renata gets baptised and spirit-filled and a few others get baptised and spirit-filled. So we're just, you know, 
looking at this and, and we're still waiting for the visa to come through and then we go out to uh, one of the Dutch assemblers and um, somebody, you know, uh, Pastor Pete, sits down and says, uh, so what are you doing then? You're going back to Australia, are you? Said, yeah, you know, one of his visa and all that. And he says, yeah, but what about these people? And I thought, that's actually a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you had your plan and you were executing on your plan? Yeah. yeah. Right. What about like, these people? Yeah, because I'd been to a few churches when I got there and I witnessed to people. They said, oh, yeah, we've got a church just like this here. Oh, great, let's go along. You're a bit naive. And, um, you know, from the first moment onwards, you realise, oh, this isn't exactly the same. People doing all sorts of weird things and, and, and me grilling them after the meeting, saying, look, what do you say? What does someone have to do to be saved? And they were getting a clear answer on it. So I actually thought, well, actually, there is no place for them to go to, really. So we decided uh, that we'd stay, and Monica's uh, immigration visa came through, made a nice, um, put in a frame, put it on the wall, made a nice little souvenir, never used it. Um, <laughs> yeah, just in case of a war um, in Hungary, I've got an Australian passport, and my two sons have, so we can all well, share. are all good. Yeah, but Monica will have to stay behind. Yeah, an Australian what, passport. But what about the others? <laughs> oh, you went fast. <laughs> yeah, but we just uh, started. I mean, probably from my side, I was probably somewhere in the back of my mind or heart. I really would have liked some of that to happen, uh, but didn't go with the you know with the, the intent that that's what we like the assembly to start. So we started with three, and then Monica's some of the university students saw they were interested. They wanted to come, and they came. And then I had friends sort of in this, in this business I was working, and they came. So um, yeah, it started there for ninety three. So it's, we got an assembly of about eighty five there. Yeah, so you sort of wonder what would happen to those people if we didn't start up there with Lord's Blessing and everything. I remember talking yesterday, Mike, you mentioned that you'd seen, since since you received the Holy Spirit over those 25 years, you've seen lots of amazing things happen, both in your life and in the life of others as well. Uh, yes. Quite miraculous things. I consider the greatest miracle in my life to be that I wanted to change. I wanted to see the Lord change me. Nevertheless, I have to share a healing testimony because I think a lot of people take a lot of courage out of um, miracles like that. Mm. Um, about 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with a tumor on my brain in a hormone production center called the hypophysis. We discovered that because I, uh, uh, I went obese, um, couldn't lose weight, and I had three miscarriages, which was it's a different story. And I'll, to cut the long story short, I was diagnosed with this um, tumor on my brain. I was already 10 years in the Lord, and I was doing the right things. I was praying. I was there at every meeting. Um, we did our um, prayer and fast. We do them every six weeks. Um, we went outreaching. Uh, people were coming in. We were seeing baptisms. The assembly was growing. So from the outward-looking observer, I was doing all the right things. And yet when this uh, diagnosis hit, um, I panicked. I'm not going to lie. I panicked. Do you know what? That's a pretty normal reaction. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people do when something smacks them in the face uh, like that. Let me get back to that point a little bit later. And and I, I started asking questions that I didn't have the answer for. And they normally start with the, with the question, why? And um, after a while, I discovered that this is, a, this is a very barren avenue to go down on. And asking why. Asking yeah. why, yeah. And uh, looking for the questions. And all of a sudden, I understood that uh, I wanted nothing more then my relationship restored with the Lord, my first love, the naivety I had when I received the Holy Spirit was gone because of the miscarriages, because of the many why questions. And I discovered this very um, strong desire to have that uh, unbroken yeah, relationship with the Lord, just the trust that I could, I could pray to Him again, not asking any questions, not asking, not putting any requests to him, just to thank him for everything that he already has done for me. And uh, actually, it was a, a winter camp. Uh, I, I forgot to take some of my medication that I was given for this uh, this uh, tumor that I was developing. The, the prognosis was that it was going to grow big enough, and in a few months' time, they're going to operate and take it out. But in preparation of that, I was given a a medication to take because it was the, the tumor itself was producing hormones, so they had to keep a balance that out yet. Yeah. 
and I forgot my medication and uh, the camp was about 10 hours drive from our home so it wasn't a question <laughs> which can we pop back home and get the medication so there I was faced with a choice what am I going to do am I going to go back and in in the sense of you know in every aspect of this question that would have been going back um, and I realized that through the testimonies of the brothers and sisters that they were sharing stories, they were sharing miracles from stage, and I just got very encouraged and very built up. And, and I thought, okay, it's not the healing, it's not the medication, it's not, there is no plan B. I need to restore my relationship with the Lord. And that it was just such a very strong desire I felt back then. Uh, um, that that's what I decided to do. I just went down on my knees every day. I would very diligently be praying. I bought myself a new Bible because the old one was colored in and I, I kind of looked for things according to the color codes, not according to content anymore. <laughs> so I bought myself a new Bible and just started to rebuild my relationship with the Lord. And that's what I was focusing on. And um, by the time the second and then the third MRI was taken, I can say I didn't care what the result was going to be. I, I achieved what I wanted to. I had this relationship going again. I didn't care. I didn't. I can't say I didn't pray for myself anymore, but just uh, very consciously I made sure that my prayer life consists more of thanking the Lord mm. rather than asking for things I needed. And that just changed a whole lot of uh, priorities within me. And, uh, yeah, the confirmation came, the MRI, the third MRI came back clean wow. and the tumor was gone. But, yeah, that wasn't a the, – the wow moment was at Christmas camp when I decided to put the medication down and then I understood what I had to do. That was the wow moment, yeah. Wow, what a great, what a great testimony. And just to come back on the fear, and I just share a recent testimony as well, I had a few – issues um, um, as far my health is concerned so I had to turn to the Lord a few times as I said in this instance I didn't pray for healings but other instances I I had to because of the pain when pain is involved that gets a bit trickier pain does get in the way sometimes doesn't <laughs> it does <laughs> it does um, recently I was diagnosed with um, some lumps in my breasts and uh, that was the very first instant when I didn't feel this fear, it didn't kick in anymore. It was just not there. The doctor told me, you know, you've got to have this checkup and biopsy and all that. And I just didn't feel any fear anymore because I knew, ah, oh, this is who you are. I've seen you before. I've defeated you before. My God did it. Um, so because you'd gone through those other yeah. things and because you could hold on to those testimonies. I knew who my enemy was. Yeah this time mm. it's all clear it's, it's a really hard thing to explain isn't it that peace that passes all understanding people people who don't have that experience just don't get it how can you not be fearful in the face of such adversity it's just such a great such a great miracle for you. <laughs> Okay, listeners, time for a little plug. If you're enjoying hearing the amazing stories of what God is doing in people's lives today, then I've got something for you. In June of this year, 2019, the Revival Fellowship is holding their international convention right here in Adelaide. The theme of the convention is, What's Your Story? We're going to have a lot of visitors from all over the world, and many will share their stories of hope, of miraculous healing, of joy and of profound happiness that a life with God brings. So from the 8th to the 10th of June 2019, we invite you to join us right here in Adelaide, Australia, to find out what's your story. Head over to www.whatsyourstory.me to find out more information or to register for this year's convention. Look forward to seeing you there. Are there other other testimonies, other miracles that you've seen in the in the working hundred? Oh yeah. Don't, don't get us going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, we're we going all day. Let's take yeah. turns. One of the most notable noticeable ones, I think, is uh, one of our sisters who had multiple breakdowns before she came to the Lord, like nervous breakdowns, mm -hmm. and um, ended up having a heart condition. 
she um, needed to have a pacemaker put into her to keep her heart beating. She was one of the first, actually, to come to our fellowship. So right in the beginning, she's been there for a long time. She uh, was probably around, I don't know, where she would have been around, around the 60s, I suppose, when yeah. she came to the Lord, maybe just 50 something, but she looked 145. And uh, uh, she, you know, she just, her health just improved and, you know, she just, the whole parents improved and, you know, and she was getting so much better. And years gone by, he's down the track, she um, she had, you know, some checkups on the pacemaker and then she's there and the doctor's saying, we'll have to go to another, you know, another room because this machine doesn't work, measuring the pacemaker, you know, it's performance. And go up to another room, another floor, I don't know, in the hospital, and he says, well, it can't be two machines that work, you probably. And um, they had to come to the conclusion that actually the pacemaker stopped working, that she's there. Um, and um, it was a permanent pacemaker. We've spoken to doctors and people like in the medical fields since then and try to get a bit of a more understanding of what exactly happens. And uh, I suppose um, one of the comments made by a doctor was that um, the question was, do you ever remove, because the pacemaker was removed after that, she didn't want it, do you ever remove a pacemaker, a permanent pacemaker from somebody who has that and he said the answer was not from a living person so um um noticeable miracle that her heart just started working on its own and and the pacemaker stopped at some stage i imagine she would have felt something like with inside of her that's why she probably had the checks done but um that was um you know we've got all the medical records for all that and that's just a, that's just a, um, something that doesn't happen unless the hand of the lord is placed in there yeah, that was a good that was one for me. What have you got? Um, this sister's testimony actually inspired uh, a new person, a visitor, to check this whole thing out and pray for the Holy Spirit. And he received and he was baptized and he was healed of a heart condition as well. He could put all his medication down and uh, he's still happily um, growing in the assembly and so this is just a story, but no, there's another one I'd like to share, which is not to do with the body. Um, a young couple with a young child uh, came to see us at one of the functions we stole from Adelaide, the, the uh, 40 Towers dinner night. Oh, okay, yeah. I remember we have a Hungarian right. version uh, ran by Matthew Robin. I know Matthew. <laughs> Everybody knows Matthew. Anyway, so they came to see a Faulty Towers dinner night and they sat down with one of our uh, the family. They just observed and how the husband and the wife and then the wife and the kids and the husband and the kids, just the whole family dynamics they were struck by. They actually decided that dinner to be their last program together. They were going to get divorced. Wow. They were going to file the papers the next day or the day after. So as they saw the family dynamics in the family from the Lord, um, they kind of thought to give it a go and try, and uh, they both prayed for the Holy Spirit. They received it. They were both baptized, and we were so blessed to observe their marriage being healed and they're still together that would have been like 20 years oh, ago wow, that's um, no maybe not that much yeah 12 13 years ago great evangelist this couple they bring a lot of people in uh, they love talking about what they have and sharing it and it's just so nice to see that whether if it's a physical need a mental need or a a wound that's bleeding on your heart for whatever reason, the Lord is so personal. They're amazing stories, and the ones about the relationship healings are really, really amazing. Mm. Because people have tried everything, haven't they, at that point? We had yeah. uh, Stephen and Joshua yeah. on, on a couple of episodes ago. God comes into their life and changes it so dramatically. Well, relationships in itself is, I suppose, the most difficult things that we deal with as humans. I mean, we get so complicated and... People don't know, you know, and they don't know when they're doing wrong even, you know, and damaging things. And, and they're so fluid, you know, everything impacts them. Yeah, um, but uh, we do actually, we do have another um, type of this type of testimony, just a man and a woman that um, they, were, they were together for a long time and their relationship went cold for two or three years before they came to the Lord and then the, the man came um, and then um, they still had like a business contact with each other so we witnessed to her and she ended up coming and they were getting married. I sort of said to her at some stage, I said, how does this work? Because you obviously, before you, you both came to the Lord, you knew that there was no way it's going to work at all 
And, um, you know, of course, now you've got this change, you know, which we know how much it can affect you. But I said, what was, you know, the, what was the thing which actually wanted you to marry him? And he, he said, well, he became the man I always wanted him to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was always wanting him to be sort of this type of person, but he was just aggressive and, and um, you know, didn't care for anything else. All those years, so she was sort of hoping that, Maybe he gets to a point where he'll change and realize these things for himself. It was the time when he actually came to the Lord and the Lord sort of changed out. him. Yeah. yeah. And, um, he became, uh, you know, the man that he was always sort of dreaming would need to actually be, but never could be. Excellent. Thanks for sharing your personal testimony, but also the testimonies of others. Have you got a favorite scripture for us? You do. Before we do that, can we advertise something? You can absolutely <laughs> advertise. When we were talking, you know, for those who are listening, we were talking about how people they don't call past in Hungary on the way uh, anywhere to Europe. It's sort of you, you're either coming to Hungary or you're not. Yes. So, let's, so what's the advertisement to come to Hungary? Um, 25 years um, is a long time. We have a, a, a generation that was basically brought up now in the fellowship and therefore I can say we have a very vibrant group of young people from the age of 10 to about 18, a great bunch of kids uh, that are really zealous and want to share it. And I'm very, very proud of them. So if uh, you're traveling with kids, this is definitely the place to bring them to and meet uh, kids that are zealous and happy and want to do things right. We have a kids camp, and last year we had the blessing of uh, of hosting an Australian from Adelaide. He was there, so uh, if you think uh, that Hungary only speaks Hungarian, don't be fooled. We do speak English. And <laughs> we you do can, it very well. So we can you... translate, so... Let not that stop you, and uh, and we will look after you. Uh, please come and visit us. We love having visitors. We love hearing testimonies, and uh, we get encouraged, and we can encourage others. I imagine your hospitality is amazing, um, but your country is also amazing too. And the cooking is pretty good too. Well, tourism in itself for, for the capital of Hungary uh, in, in total is just going up and up and up every year. More and more people are visiting Hungary. Very beautiful city for yeah. everybody who has been there that I've spoken to. Oh, well, expect some visitors. There's a lot of people that listen to this podcast. Well, let's, uh, let's see if we can get a few people over there to come and say hello. <laughs> so just in closing, how about we hear your favourite scripture? Okay. Well, my favourite scripture is James 4.17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So why does that, why does that scripture speak to you? To me... God is not a thing we visit every Sunday. God is the center, the Alpha and the Omega, and he teaches us. But with that comes responsibility. And once he teaches me the depths of love, it is my responsibility to pass it on. Mm. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes. We'll see you either when I'm in Hungary next or the next <laughs> time you're out here. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I hope you enjoyed that testimony as much as I did. God sure has done a lot in their lives and in the lives of those around them. If you can make it happen on your next visit to Europe, drop in and see them in Budapest. They would love it and I guarantee you'll have a fantastic time. You can contact them via www.revival.hu but you'll need to click on the Google Translate button if you can't read Hungarian. If you're enjoying the podcast, then rate it on your favourite podcaster app. It certainly does help us get the word out there that God's power is alive today. Thanks for listening, and until next time, God bless.